Not guilty, not guilty, ten Charles times. Charles Manson, described today by the star witness Jury again. The so-called Night Stalker case reached its verdict today. Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime the of murder. The woman suspected of shooting Selena is still holding police at the Music bay. producer Phil Spector was convicted In Monday. In Los Angeles, a killer the police are calling the Hillside Strangler. Do you find that Mr. Depp has proven all the elements of defamation? Answer, yes. Hey, we're back with season two, and I want to talk today about Selena Quintanilla. I feel like we never left, so. Yeah, well, short hiatus. But what are your thoughts on her? Were you ever a fan? I mean, this happened in 1993, right? So she, her career kind of spanned over a few years. I mean, I was kind of young, so I didn't really know much about her. But what about you? Did you follow her Yeah, she was big when I was in high school. I didn't really follow her, but obviously, you know, the trial happened right around OJ, which was anything and everything i think it happened what a few weeks after or like within like weeks within one week i think oh, it was within, six days yeah. yeah as far as like the verdict so i mean oj just took over everything but selena was huge especially yeah. for mexican americans and like folks in texas so big case probably would have been bigger if it wasn't for the trial of the century okay do you think her career would have skyrocketed was that was she on that kind of trajectory? Again, I don't I mean, really know. I'm familiar with her music now, which I like. There are some songs that I like. But what do you think about her career? I think so. I mean, she was so successful at such a young age. And to have that type of success, Grammy-level success yeah. as a teenager, I mean, you got to think that she would have been performing for yeah. decades if it weren't for this Well, my first murder. intro to Selena was the J-Lo movie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I think that's where I fell in love with J-Lo, who anyone who knows me knows she can do no wrong. I think your wife knows this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Romex big yeah. fan. Yeah. Huge fan. She can do no wrong. That was, I think, my first intro to J-Lo. And I think that's how she got her start, too. But that's where I kind of got familiar with the story. And it was really intriguing. And so I started doing some digging. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I remember J-Lo. I'm a little bit older from Living Color. So a long time oh, no. ago. See, yeah. I don't know her from, from that. Yeah. But let's get into it. I mean, I want to give you a little bit of an intro because, I mean, this has been a really long time. So let's go over the facts and then let's dive into the case. Let's because that's your area of expertise. Of course. You know, whenever someone gets shot in the back, I'm the person <laughs> they call. Call Nima Romani. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. Selena Quintanilla Perez, also known as Selena, was a Mexican American singer and fashion designer who is best known for her 1992 breakthrough album Entre Mi Mundo, her 1993 album Live, where she won a Grammy. So there you go, Grammy level, and 1994 album Amor Prohibido, which became one of the best selling Latin albums in the US. She's also one of the greatest Latino artists of all time and still continues to leave a legacy till today. So just to put a pin on this for a second, I think the legacy, unfortunately, is also, you know, everything that's kind of happened with the family. And um, little fun fact, the family's releasing on, um, they're releasing, I think, music or songs that have never been heard before. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, two, yeah, year. Tupac style where, you know, even from the other side, we're still getting, you know, B-sides. <laughs> Tupac always, like, yeah. drops an album, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. every few years. He reminds us that he's still around. So as Selena and her brand, her band, excuse me, called Selena y los Dinos grew, a new guitarist named Chris, Chris Perez joined them. He and Selena caught romantic feelings for each other, so there's that Hollywood love, and hid the relationship from this approving family. They later eloped in 1992 and were married all the way up until she was murdered in 1995. So very tragic three-year marriage. During this time, a registered nurse and huge fan of Selena, Yolanda Saldivar, asked Selena's father to start a fan club in San Antonio, Texas, where she became president of the club, manager of Selena's boutiques, and a trusted friend of Selena and her family. Yolanda Saldivar was born in San Antonio, Texas, and had six brothers and sisters. Before becoming a fan of Selena, Yolanda, Yolanda excuse me, had stayed close to her Texan roots and favored country music. As she became more involved with Selena and her family, she became a significant asset as she was able to grow Selena's fan club to 5,000 in less than four years. The more Yolanda had, had been entrusted with managing Selena's boutiques and her fan club, the clearer it became that Saldivar was embezzling money from them. This led to Selena and her father firing Yolanda in early 1995. So this is the motive, right, which we'll get into shortly, but this is, I think, where, you know, that sort of prosecutors yeah. had developed. Yeah, yeah, of course. The lesson is obviously you're starting to develop your fan club and you're following, so you got to watch out for those super fans, <laughs> yeah. Leon. Don't murder yeah, me, guys, yeah, yeah, please. Exactly. I'm young. After being fired, Yolanda asked to meet with Selena at a Days Inn motel in Corpus Christi to give her financial records that she was refusing to hand over. Saldivar tried to delay the handover by claiming that she was raped in Mexico. 
Selena drove Yolanda to a local hospital where they denied her because the rape had been done in a different country. Interestingly, I had also uh, watched a documentary where they talked about Selena pulling some of the nurses aside at the hospital and telling them that she doesn't believe that her friend was actually raped. So I think that was good for the prosecution. Anytime you get in facts about the defendant being a liar, you want to dirty them up, it's always helpful for the state's right. case. Because this is, I mean, this is a big lie to make up, right? A rape, you, you get a whole rape kit, you get the hospital and everything involved, only to find out that it's completely fabricated. As they returned to the motel, Selena demanded for the financial records to be turned over, where the conversation got heated. Saldivar then took a .38 Taurus model 85 revolver from her purse, pointed it at Selena. As Selena fled the hotel room, Saldivar shot her in the back, severing an artery. The hotel clerk called 911, where Selena was rushed to the hospital but died from blood loss shortly after. Saldivar fled the scene and had a 10-hour standoff with the police before she was arrested. So tough case to defend, right? You're looking at first-degree murder. Um, we're going to go through all the facts, but I mean, if you're the defense attorney in this case, what can you possibly do? I mean, generally speaking, you're going to argue, it wasn't me or I didn't mean to do it. So we know it was Saldivar. So then the I didn't mean to do it defense comes out at trial. Well, the defense attorney's wife actually told him, don't take this case. And if you do, for God's sake, don't win it. Yeah. And I think, you know, when you have a celebrity, somebody this young and, um, you know, someone who really was loved. Right. So everyone in the Latino community uh, speaks so highly of her because of how kind she was to her fans. Right. So you're not ha you're not, we're not talking about some diva like, I don't know. Uh, Mariah Carey, right? Oh, <laughs> shots fired. Shots fired, like Mariah Carey, even maybe J-Lo. I've heard some, you know, bad stories about her. But you're talking about someone who people actually liked, you know, they respected. And so when, when something like this happens in the community that I think it, it's just really hard to get someone to 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 be in your corner when it comes to Saldivar, which I think is a good segue into let's talk about the forum shopping that they did. Well, yeah, let's talk about it. I mean, you know, Cases come down to really likability and credibility, right? We talked about credibility, Saldivar lying about being raped, right? But likability, Selena was beloved in her hometown of Corpus mm -hmm. Christi. And one, you know, minor victory that the defense got was getting the case moved out of there, getting it to Houston. Again, different venue, a little bit more defense friendly because it would have been tough um, for Saldivar to get a fair trial anywhere in Texas, but especially think, in Corpus do you think, Christi. I mean, you really, it was still the same state. I mean, different city. Is it really that? Talk to us a little bit about that, right? You were former federal prosecutor. Is it, is moving from city to city, from maybe community, like, is that really something that is going to make or break a defense? Well, look, it's a tough case to defend, right? And if you're going to try to defend a case like Saldivar's, where the victim is so be loved, particularly in a specific part of the state. You're looking for every advantage you can get. You're not going to get a not guilty in the case. We talked about OJ, right? This isn't an OJ type case. This is a case where you want to get one or two jurors, maybe hang the panel um, and try to live to fight another day. Houston tends to be a little bit more liberal in terms of the jury pool. And again, not as close to Selena in terms of loving the victim. Again, she's universally loved throughout the state, but you don't want to be trying that case in Selena's hometown. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Do you have any experience with negotiators, right? Because what she did is she locked herself up in her trunk, or trunk, truck, and uh, I think for nine or 10 hours, as I mentioned, and they were trying to get her out because she had the gun to her head trying to commit suicide. Do you have any experience with negotiators? And um, specifically, the negotiator said, hey, maybe this was an accident. And so I think she kind of clung to that, like, hey, I'm just going to use this as an excuse. So is that a mess up on the negotiator's part for saying that, or is it just standard procedure? Yeah, I mean, this is the type of situation where you see where law enforcement and prosecution, their kind of interests diverge, right? If you're a negotiator, your job is to end the standoff, make sure that person, number one, doesn't kill any other people, right, after killing Selena, and then doesn't kill herself. So you have very different interests um, as a hostage negotiator as someone who's negotiating with someone who's trying to kill herself mm -hmm. than you do with the prosecutor because the prosecutor you're just thinking about hey let me gather the evidence to put this person in prison for the rest of their life okay so was it a screw up for mentioning that you think i don't think so i mean look and this is one of the big appellate issues in the case right so let's kind of take a step back the prosecution got in a lot 
of damaging statements that Saldivar made, right? So we all know those are generally admissions of a party opponent, hearsay 101, rules of evidence, right? The defendant's own statements come in against her. Mm -hmm. Now, there are obviously some exceptions, right? We all know Miranda. We all know the Fifth Amendment. So the defense is arguing, just like they did at trial and on appeal. Let's not forget Saldivar is in prison right now maintaining mm -hmm. her innocence. The primary argument on appeal is, hey, I asked for an attorney. You didn't give me one. You took these statements. Those statements were obtained in violation of Miranda. They should have been suppressed. They didn't come into evidence. Right. And then she also, uh, the confession she signed did not state that uh, this was accidental, right? So that was a big part of the defense's case. And um, I forget his name, but somebody who overheard this conversation oh, in the, the, in the officer, it was yeah. a police officer, he actually testified. So talk to us a little bit about that. What was, I mean, was that the turning point for the defense? I mean, granted, you know, they, they lost the trial, but is that one of the, or was that the only uh, leg they had to stand on? Again, different case, but we're kind of going back to OJ, right? Sometimes the best defense is a good offense. And if you could put law enforcement on trial and allege police misconduct, there's a lot of jurors out there that will buy into that type mm -hmm. of argument, right? So let's talk about the confession. Obviously, the standoff ends. You know, so, um, Saldivar is in custody for the murder of Selena. Uh, she's being interrogated, and she signs a confession admitting to killing Selena. She doesn't talk about the accidental discharge, right? That's the whole defense in the case, which would be involuntary manslaughter. I'm sure we're gonna be talking about it, but um, so they get the signed confession. Nowhere in the confession or the police report is any mention of an accidental discharge. That's something that was caught in the recording during the standoff. But apparently there was a police officer outside the interrogation room that ended up testifying that Silver was talking about this accidental discharge. It doesn't make its way into the report at all so the defense makes a big deal about it goes after law enforcement saying listen this is misconduct this is fabricated and well here's me being a little prosecutor you know in my own right but she let's take this back to for a second to amanda knox okay uh similar situation she signed a confession but there was a language barrier there right so for those you know for those of us who who don't know um you know she was in italy she she uh, was accused of murdering her um roommate so she signs a confession she doesn't understand saldivar speaks fluent english did she not read i mean wow talk to us about that a little bit right i mean it is is she not expected to correct what she's reading, right? I mean, she, I would assume, read the confession and signed it. So is that on her at all, or is it still police misconduct? Look, it's hard, right? You know, nowadays, when these interviews are conducted, everything's videotaped. We're yeah. talking about, like, years ago when, you know, it was Rodney King who was one of the first times police misconduct had ever been caught on mm -hmm. video. Um, so very different era you know, there were certainly no video cameras. There weren't even audio recordings. The fact that the audio recording of that nine, 10 hour mm -hmm. standoff with Saldivar was caught on audio, pretty rare back then. We're talking about almost 30 years mm -hmm. ago now. So who knows what happened in that interrogation room? Um, I have respect for police officers, but I've seen a lot of officer misconduct, especially in cases where there's a lot of pressure to get a confession from someone. So, um, Possible to know what happened. Ultimately, though, I don't buy the accidental discharge argument at all. And I'm oh, sure yeah. we're going to talk about yeah. why. But certainly to the extent that Saldivar told officers during the standoff, and I believe she probably re-raised it in that interrogation mm -hmm. room before she signed the confession, that should have made its yeah. way into the well, report. Well, let's talk about it. I don't believe it for one second either. Because, look, most importantly, I... I I don't know anything about guns, so I don't know if they accidentally discharge or not. Maybe they do. But nine hour standoff, gun doesn't go off. It's held to her head the entire time. Not only is there audio, but there's video of it, right? There's yeah. video footage of her sitting there with the gun to her head. Um, she has this gun for a few days before. She returns it. She goes and buys it again. Never goes off. Interestingly, the one time it accidentally goes off is when Selena is running for her life. So, um, yeah, the prosecution made a big deal about that yeah. during the case, holding the gun to his head. Um, let's talk about another less. She bought the gun. She said she was a nurse. She needed it for protection against her yeah. patients. Obviously, she's not a nurse. Look, I think a lot of the damaging evidence, I mean, we started about it. Look, when you shoot someone in the back, that's never good. But the hotel staff, right, that heard 
Selena's, we call the dying declaration, the last words. Like, she shot me that bitch, yeah. you know? You know, and the fact that, you know, it's hospital staff that call 911. You accidentally shoot someone and exactly. how, how are you going to convince jurors that, hey, I accidentally shot someone. I didn't realize I shot someone, you know? And then I left. One up you. I was looking for her in my truck. I'm like, my, my, what? Yeah. So so she, the obviously the whole standoff happens in her truck, right? Outside in the parking lot. But you shoot someone in the hotel room. You come in and out of the hotel room three times, right? You don't notice the dead body on the ground. You got to step over a pool of blood. And you don't call 911. And then you don't mention this accidental shooting story until... Like 10 hours yeah. later. Yeah, so. I don't buy it, and I agree. I mean, all that blood that she lost, right? I, how do you, how, and how did she not step into it, right? If she yeah. had stepped into it, in my mind, it'd be like, okay, she really didn't see it. She, it to me, it's like you intentionally walked over it, right? When you see a puddle, you walk over it. Of course. And so three times, I, three times, you go back and forth, and then you're looking for her, but you shot her. I mean, again, I'm trying to think as like a logical person. A gun goes off. I'm going to be like, holy crap, where's the, what happened, right? Yeah. I'm not just going to sit there and be like, oh, where'd Selena go? And then let's kind of take it one step back to why did she even have a gun? Salivar mm -hmm. said that she wanted to kill herself. She wanted to kill herself, but she accidentally killed Selena. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing the prosecution did that I thought was a very smart thing is they didn't include any lesser included, right? So we're getting the legal weeds a little bit. You got your first degree premeditated murder. You got your second degree, which is murder, but not premeditated. And then if it's accidental, you're coming all the way down to involuntary manslaughter. So the defense had done a better job and convinced the judge, really on that verdict form, you should have had first degree murder, guilty, not mm -hmm. guilty, and involuntary manslaughter, guilty, not guilty. Sometimes jurors will go for that split verdict, that compromised verdict. But the defense argued for not guilty at all. Maybe their client didn't want to even argue for involuntary manslaughter, but maybe the state of Texas smartly didn't even put on the verdict form to not even give those jurors an opportunity to come back yeah. with anything less than first degree murder. Well, another thing too, which I want to hear your thoughts about, is that she didn't get up on the stand, right? Oh, she'd be and destroyed so on the She would be, but do you think it was her decision or do you think her attorneys were just really successful in saying, look, you got to sit this one out because you are not likable, which by the way, she was like 34, 35. That's like two years older than me. She looked like she could be my grandma. I mean, what like what was happening in the 90s? Nina? Yeah, like, yeah, I mean, no, it, was, it was a different time. I think it was before fillers and Botox. Yeah, so, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was just a horrible look. Yeah. But I digress. But do you think it was um, just really good strategy because she was not likable? She didn't and again, we're talking about Selena Quintanilla here. So, or or do you think she just chose? Yeah, I think there's a couple of reasons. One, obviously, she was not likable. She would have been destroyed on cross examination, like we were. But importantly, that Miranda question, right? So, even if the statements were obtained unlawfully in violation of Miranda, Saldivar asked for an attorney. Officers were interrogating her anyway. Even if it's excluded, it's suppressed because it was obtained in violation of the Constitution. If she gets up there and testifies, then those statements come in during cross-examination. Even an improper mm -hmm. confession in violation of Miranda can come in during cross-examination. So basically, she takes the stand, all the statements come in, even if they were improperly obtained. So that's another risk that the defense yeah. saw. Look, ultimately, look, it's a tough case, right? You need another theory of the case, whether it's suicide, whether it's Selena's dad, you know, I mean, it's sort of crazy defense theories. I mean, you're hoping, like I said, you get reasonable doubt um, in one or two Texas jurors. I didn't buy the dad story either, which, by the way, I was telling my husband today when, when I was reading about it, like, it's always the dad, you know? They always try to bring in the dad somehow. He, it's his fault. They did that with Casey Anthony. You yeah, know, they angry in, dad. Angry does, dad. Dad doesn't approve of the, is. you know, the marriage or the boyfriend yeah, or the son-in-law. Exactly. You know, and so. um, he already was very overprotective, right? They had the issue with Chris, yeah. her husband. Yeah. So uh, interesting that it's always the dad. But um, uh, the defense attorney did not want to put him on the stand because he knew that that would have just not gone oh, off well yeah. with the jury. Like he's a grieving father. You're gonna put, put a him victim's on a dad on there. I mean, Unbelievable. Terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But here's what I want to talk about: premeditation, and the fact that she went and bought this gun. And I want to talk about that proximity to the fight she has with Selena's dad. Right. So he tells her, "Look, you know, you're embezzling money. You're out. You're no longer welcome." The very next day, she goes off and buys a gun, and she lies about it, or she applies for sure. the gun. 
And then she meets up with Selena. Things get cleared up. And she goes and returns it. And then, you know, when Selena confronts her, then she goes and buys it again. That, to me, is, I mean, that is your smoking gun. Yeah, Literally. No, yeah, no pun intended. I mean, that's that premeditation, yeah. right? You go buy the gun, you set it up, you meet her at a hotel room. You got all the motive in the world because you've been fired after stealing money from, you right. know, her boutique and this fan club. And all these fans are like, I haven't got anything. Yeah. yeah, no, exactly. So I think, I think that, for me, was just the hardest thing for defense to overcome. Yeah, I mean, look, if you're prosecuting murder cases, you want to look for motive, you want to look for means, you want to look for opportunity. This case really checks off all those boxes. Very difficult case to defend. Right. So how do you feel about the sentence, right? Um, do you think it was sufficient? Do you think... I think so, because look, you're talking to, about someone that has zero acceptance of responsibility, even now in prison. She says that she's innocent. She loves Selena. It was accidental. It was unintentional. If I'm a judge, if I'm a jury, and I'm thinking, okay, is this person going to get life? Are they going to get 25 years? They're going to get something else. I'm like, listen, is there some remorse, some some acceptance of response for what you've done? You've taken away someone's daughter, someone's sister, one of the most talented um, entertainers of our generation. And there's none of that, right? You're talking about someone that even while the jury was out, and by the way, they're only out for two hours. That's how quick of a verdict this was in a murder case. They okay. didn't buy any of it. Yeah. So she's signing autographs for crazy, like, Selena fans. I have no idea. I mean, this is someone that still to this very day does not accept any responsibility yeah. for what she did. So this, in my opinion, is someone that deserves life in prison. Well, what I think is interesting to me is that she she's done multiple interviews, obviously, some of them yeah. behind bars. And she continues to, of course, maintain this whole like, oh, you know, I was, you know, I love Selena, whatever. But several times she said, you know, there's these secret diaries and there's this, this and that that only I know or like I'll take it to the grave. Why? If there's something out there that's going to get you out of prison, right? Wouldn't you, it to me, it's. It's so like Looney Tune to think that like you're sitting there and like gloating over the fact that there's this deep dark secret that only you know when you're gonna take it to the grave. It makes no sense, and it makes me think that she really was a deranged, obsessed fan. Oh, of course. And then when she was fired, I mean, she lost everything, right? She was nothing before. Yeah. She latched onto Selena, and then she was running her fan club, was with her at all her concerts. I mean, this was her whole life, right? This was her job. This was her social circle. This was her dream. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it was all taken away from her. And certainly not a legal excuse, but we understand the motivation why someone would go Absolutely. off the deep end and yeah. do something like this. Right. And I think that's exactly what happened. And it's it's really scary because, I mean... Were, were there no no red flags, right? I mean, the family really liked her. The dad has done multiple interviews saying, you know, we, we loved her. We accepted her as one of our own. She's come to dinner at, at our house, you know? And so to think that someone is capable of doing yeah. that. Yeah, one of the dad's interviews that really kind of resonates with me is um, obviously Saldivar still in her prison interview says, I've done nothing wrong. Um, I have nothing to apologize for. Yeah. I would say, bitch... Even if you accidentally <laughs> killed someone, if right. you really believe you accidentally killed someone and shot someone, you still should accept responsibility yeah. for that. Even if it's an accident, you killed someone. Yeah. She's accepting nothing. I'm talking like sociopath. And this one thing the dad said is like, even if what you're saying is true, there's not been one apology for accidentally killing my daughter. Right. And accidents happen all the time. Yeah. I mean, we're in the business of misery. We see it, sure. and not murders. But yeah, I agree to think that she's never said, you know, I'm I'm so sorry in no. any way shape or form no it's just it's 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 scary no. because she has this like reminds me of jody arias she's another yeah. one that is maybe we should do a, a, something on her guys yeah, yeah absolutely no, yeah, yeah she is just she's fascinating well, she's jody terms, arias yeah. was fascinating yeah. she was very likable very likable yeah, another interesting case obviously you know i do court tea every every week with her attorney kirk narmi and he talks about it all the time great lawyer by the way um, he saved her life, even though she was convicted. But another Looney Tunes. So. Yeah, crazy Looney Tune. Okay, well, final thoughts, because we can sit here and chat for hours, but... Yeah, I mean, look, in terms of the, the legal case, I think it got overshadowed because of OJ, but still, probably one of the most important murder cases of an enter entertainer, at least from the past 40, 50 years. So definitely one to track, obviously. I think there's going to be more interest 
as new music comes mm -hmm. out but really a sad case a career that was cut way too short and as far as the merits as a legal defense not a good one um, that's where we got that quick guilty verdict and life sentence there yeah. in Texas. I think I can truly say this is one of those times where the jury got it 1000% right because they don't always get it right yeah, but this time that. they did you know and uh, I hope she rots in prison. I agree with you Liana. That's it. All right. Well, thanks for joining. Thanks and for having me. Of course. Uh, I think you're now my co-host. I don't oh, know. So I, I, I don't know. I passed. I, I got promoted. Yes. yes. Uh, finally. <laughs> I finally made it. I think it's because everyone else sucks. Yeah, yeah. I'm kidding. Right. We love you. Yeah. So I think you'll be on uh, more uh, more frequently this time around. And we love hearing your, all right, your can't take wait for, on all of this. Can't so, wait for the next one. We'll thanks. see you next time. All right. Bye.